Aesthetic judgment is the process of making judgments about the beauty or ugliness of things. It is a complex process that involves a variety of factors, including our personal preferences, our cultural background, and our understanding of the object being judged. It has implications for our understanding of art, beauty and human experience. In the past year or so with the arrival of generative AI art the questions raised by aesthetic judgments have become even more relevant. Does AI art reflect the human experience? Can it even be considered art? In this video, we will take a look at the different aspects of aesthetic judgment, including their criteria for making these judgments, if these judgments are subjective or objective and the role of culture upon them. We will end with a discussion on the impact generative AI may have on aesthetics. One of the central questions in the philosophy of aesthetic judgment is whether aesthetic judgments are subjective or objective. Are aesthetic judgments simply expressions of our personal preferences, or are they based on objective criteria that exist independently of our minds? Subjectivists, as the name implies, argue that aesthetic judgments are subjective. They point to the fact that different people often have different aesthetic judgments, and that there is no single objective standard of beauty. They also contend that aesthetic judgments are often based on personal or cultural preferences that are not rooted in any objective criteria. Objectivists, on the other hand, argue that aesthetic judgments are objective. No surprise there. They point to the fact that we often make aesthetic judgments about things that we have never encountered before, and that we often agree with others about our aesthetic judgments. They also think that there are objective aesthetic criteria, such as balance, harmony, and proportion, that can be used to judge the beauty of things regardless of personal or cultural biases. Another important question in the philosophy of aesthetic judgment is the nature of beauty. First, let's consider if beauty is a property of the object itself, or is it something that we project onto the object? Some agree with Plato's argument that beauty is a property of the object itself. In their view, this means that beauty is not simply a matter of personal preference, but is rather something that is objective and universal. Others believe that Aristotle's view that beauty is not a property of the object itself is the correct one. They think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and that what we call beauty is simply our subjective response to certain objects. But, what is it about something that makes it beautiful? There are three common schools of thought on determining the beauty of an object. First, formalists believe that the beauty of an object is determined by its form, rather than its content. For example, a formalist might say that a painting is beautiful because of its composition, balance, and use of color, rather than because of the subject matter it depicts. Second, expressivists think that the beauty of an object is determined by its ability to express certain emotions or ideas. For example, an expressivist might say that a piece of music is beautiful because it expresses joy, sadness, or love. And, lastly, Instrumentalists believe that the beauty of an object is determined by its ability to serve some purpose. For example, an instrumentalist might say that a poem is beautiful because it teaches us something about the human condition or because it helps us to appreciate the beauty of nature. Some philosophers also further distinguish between perceptual beauty, which is the beauty that we experience through our senses, and conceptual beauty, which is the beauty that we experience through our intellect. Other philosophers distinguish between natural beauty, which is the beauty that we find in nature, and artifactual beauty, which is the beauty that we find in human-made objects. Now, we should discuss theories of aesthetic judgment. One of the most important and influential theories of aesthetic judgment is Immanuel Kant's theory. Kant argued that aesthetic judgments are subjective, but that they have a claim to universality. He also argued that aesthetic judgments are based on the form of an object, rather than its content. Kant distinguished between two types of aesthetic judgments, judgments of taste and judgments of sublimity. Judgments of taste are judgments about the beauty or ugliness of things. Judgments of sublimity are judgments about things that are awe-inspiring or overwhelming. According to Kant, judgments of taste are characterized by these four features. First, there's disinterestedness. This idea says that we judge something beautiful because we find it pleasing, not because it has any practical value or because it is useful to us. Second, there's universality. This is the argument that we believe that everyone should agree with our judgment of beauty, 
even if they do not find the object pleasing themselves. Third, we have purposiveness without a purpose. This means that we perceive the form of the object as being purposive, but we do not know what the purpose is. Lastly, there's necessity. In this feature, we believe that our judgment of beauty is necessary, and that it cannot be changed. Kant argued that judgments of taste are based on the free play of our cognitive faculties, the imagination and the understanding. When we encounter a beautiful object, our imagination is freely stimulated and our understanding is unable to fully comprehend the object. This results in a feeling of pleasure, which is the basis of our judgment of beauty. Of course, some have challenged Kant's theory. Some mention that it is difficult to explain what disinterested pleasure is. Another challenge is that we should care about the universal validity of our aesthetic judgments. In addition to Kant's theory, there are a number of other theories of aesthetic judgment. The hedonistic theory argues that aesthetic judgments are based on the pleasure that we derive from objects. For example, you might derive a pleasurable feeling from hearing a soaring guitar solo or viewing a painting by Van Gogh. The cognitivist theory contends that aesthetic judgments are based on our cognitive understanding of objects. For example, someone might say that a painting is beautiful because it has a balanced composition and a harmonious color scheme or that a piece of music has a complex melodic structure. The emotivist theory states that aesthetic judgments are expressions of our emotions. For example, someone might say that a painting is beautiful because it makes them feel happy or that a piece of music makes them feel sad. The expressivist theory argues that aesthetic judgments are about the emotions that objects express. In this case, someone might say that a painting is beautiful because it expresses the artist's unique vision of the world. Or a song is beautiful because it captures the essence of the human experience in a unique and powerful way. Now, we can move on to the significant role of culture plays in aesthetic judgment. Our cultural background shapes our preferences, our understanding of beauty, and our aesthetic criteria. For example, what is considered to be beautiful in one culture may not be considered to be beautiful in another culture. One way that culture influences aesthetic judgment is by shaping our perceptions of the world around us. For example, different cultures have different notions of what is considered beautiful in terms of physical appearance, clothing, and architecture. These different notions are often influenced by factors such as climate, religion, and history. For example, the art of ancient Greece and Rome is very different from the art of medieval Europe, which is very different from the art of modern Japan. Each of these art styles reflects the cultural values and beliefs of the time and place in which it was produced. Another way that culture influences aesthetic judgment is by exposing us to different types of art and cultural artifacts. The art and artifacts that we are exposed to can help us to develop our own aesthetic preferences. For example, someone who grows up in a culture that has a rich tradition of painting may be more likely to appreciate paintings than someone who grows up in a culture that does not have such a tradition. Finally, culture can also influence aesthetic judgment by providing us with criteria for evaluating works of art. For example, in Western culture, we often judge works of art based on their technical skill, originality, and emotional impact. However, other cultures may have different criteria for evaluating art. For example, in some cultures, art is judged primarily based on its religious or cultural significance. Culture can influence aesthetic judgment in both positive and negative ways. On the one hand, culture can expose us to new forms of art and beauty that we might not otherwise encounter. On the other hand, culture can also limit our aesthetic horizons and make us more closed-minded to different types of art. Also, culture is not static. It is constantly evolving and changing. This means that our aesthetic judgments are also likely to evolve and change over time. In that vein of discussion, we are currently experiencing a huge change in our artistic culture, the arrival of AI systems that can create pictures and music quickly via relatively simple text prompts. Generative AI art has a number of interesting implications for the philosophy of aesthetic judgment. Generative AI models are trained on large datasets of images, text, or other media to learn the statistical patterns that underlie different artistic styles. Once trained, these models can be used to generate new artworks that are similar to the artworks in the training dataset, but that are also unique and original. One question this raises is whether or not generative AI art is truly creative. 
Some people argue that generative AI models are simply copying the artworks in the training dataset and that they are not capable of true creativity. Basically, it's just linear algebra and other fancy statistics all the way down. Others argue that generative AI models are able to combine and recombine elements of the training dataset in new and original ways and that this process is a form of creativity, in the same way a human artist might be influenced by previous artists. Another question is whether generative AI art can be considered as art at all. Some people argue that generative AI art is too artificial and lacks the human touch to be considered as art. Others argue that generative AI art is a new and innovative form of art that should be appreciated on its own terms. We also have the question of who is the author of a generative AI artwork? Is it the programmer who created the AI model, or the AI model itself? Generative AI models can create new works of art that are original in the sense that they have never been seen or heard before. However, they are also often derivative in the sense that they are based on existing works of art. This raises the question of whether originality is still a necessary condition for aesthetic value. Generative AI art is challenging traditional notions of aesthetic judgment by blurring the line between human-created and machine-created art. In the past, it was relatively easy to distinguish between human-created art and machine-created art. However, generative AI models are now able to create works of art that are indistinguishable from human-created works and becoming better and better on almost a daily basis. This raises the question of whether there is any meaningful difference between the two. One of my favorite movie examples of this is in the movie I Robot where Sonny responds to Spooner's question of can he create art by saying can you? Generative AI art also challenges our traditional notions of beauty. Generative AI models can create new works of art that are beautiful in a variety of ways, but they can also create works of art that are disturbing, unsettling, or even grotesque. This raises the question of whether there are any universal standards of beauty, or whether beauty is entirely subjective. Overall, generative AI art is a new and exciting field that has the potential to challenge and change our understanding of aesthetic judgment. It will be interesting to see how it continues to evolve in the years to come. As we can see from our discussion, the philosophy of aesthetic judgment is a complex and multifaceted field of study. There is no single agreed-upon theory of aesthetic judgment and there are a number of different philosophical theories that have been proposed to explain the nature and basis of aesthetic judgment. With generative AI now thrown into the mix, it becomes even more complex to make these judgments. In my view, the best theory of aesthetic judgment is likely to be one that incorporates elements from both objective and subjective theories. It is likely to be a theory that recognizes the role of both feeling and reason in aesthetic judgment and that recognizes the role of both the formal properties and the content of objects in aesthetic judgment. What are your thoughts on aesthetic judgment and how generative AI may affect these judgments in the near future? Thanks for watching. Please give us a like if you enjoyed this video and feel free to comment to let us know your thoughts on it. Also, check out our other study review videos on other philosophers and philosophies.